It's good to see you all this morning, to be with you as we open up God's Word. I think before we do that this morning, I think for any of you that might be worried, I should point out um, we are not hiring a second pastor named Noel from Uganda. <laughs> Just want to point that out. Noel is coming from Kenya, and I really wish Pastor Rob was in here right now so I could make fun of him. It's just not as fun when he's not here. You guys can poke fun at him later. Really quick, I do want to tell you, do you remember several weeks ago when we had the ladies from Full Circle here that attend uh, Pastor Noel's church, uh, Mamlaka Hill Chapel, and that uh, the the title uh, of their ministry is Full Circle, and they they reached out to prostitutes, and they were trying to raise, uh, they were here for a conference, but they've been trying to raise a few thousand dollars to uh, set up a a factory sort of sorts to be able to train these women when they bring them in off the streets uh, how to make a living. And they were focusing on peanut butter because it's a, a low cost way to make a good wage there. And I could not believe it, but that night I got to sit down with them at dinner after we took an offering here for them and I got to tell them that they received an offering for $10,000. $10,000. They were so excited, Nancy, in, in her cute little accent. She goes, I, I just don't know what to do to clap, to scream. I'm so full of it. I, I feel like I'm going to explode. Was, anyway, so... I told them, uh, hopefully they can send us some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when they get underway. Uh, And I cannot express to you their gratitude in any way that does it justice, but thank you. Thank you for supporting this ministry. Thank you for remembering that the Church of God does not meet in this building, but it meets all over the world. And I look forward to the day that we're walking in glory and we get to run into some of the women that they got to help save and bring to Jesus because of your generosity. I look forward to that day, don't you, church? Amen. Amen. With that said, this week we are in our final message in our hostage series. Now the premise of this series is, be, is that in our lives there is something that always holds us hostage at some point whether it be worry, anger, bitterness. It's been a heavy series, exposing some of the deepest hurts and sins that you and I deal with. Now, I've noticed two truths in every area that we've discussed. And the first truth I I shared in my message on lies is that behind everything that holds us hostage is a lie. For example, if you are being held hostage by worry, the lie is that you can't trust God. And then yesterday, as I was preparing this final message, the second truth hit me. Not a one of these things, not a one of these things that hold us hostage is is such a case or so powerful that the freedom that Jesus Christ brings us cannot be found. Every one of these things that hold us hostage, no matter how tightly the power of God is that much greater. There is hope in every one of these areas. And before I even started on addiction this morning, I just wanted to stop and say, church, do you not want to thank Jesus? Say thank you that we have hope no matter what's going on in our lives. Is that not why we come here? Why we worship? This morning... We're talking about addiction. And I will admit that this is the one that I have struggled with the most. I don't know if it's because it's such a huge topic. I don't know what to include, not to include, and obviously the Holy Spirit guides you. I don't know if it's because it's personal to so many of you. I don't know if it's because it's personal to my family. But I know that it's my simple prayer that God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, will touch my life and touch your life today where it comes to the area of addiction. Is that not your prayer powerhouse? So pray for me, please. Now, as we start with this, I want to start with a challenge to you, and this is why. Anyone who has ever been addicted... Any person who's ever had a loved one who's addicted, any counselor or pastor who's ever worked with anybody who has an addiction will tell you the number one thing keeping them from breaking free in that addiction is denial. 
absolute denial. It's the number one thing that keeps them from finding freedom in Jesus Christ. Now this means that the person either does not believe that they have a problem or that their issue is not that severe. And I challenge you this morning to ask God to reveal to you if you may have an area of struggle that could be an addiction or on its way to becoming one. It costs you nothing to open yourself up to the possibility that you may have a struggle that you are not able to see. But it could cost you everything if you are too full of pride to think that it's not possible for you to struggle. And this goes for me as it does for you. So this morning, will you open up your hearts and minds and see what the Lord has to say to you? You can answer. There you go. Now let me tell you, this is why I give you this challenge. Addictions, they don't discriminate. Okay, this is not just a problem for heroin addicts, not just a problem for alcoholics. It's not a problem that's just relegated to casinos or back alley drug deals. In fact, I believe the addictions that are done every day in plain sight are so dangerous simply because we don't pay attention to them. And when we don't pay attention to them, we give them the strength to continue on in our lives. We give the enemy just what he wants. And so I want to pause this morning and I want to name a few addictions just to get your mind rolling. And what, and what, I, what I'm hoping you'll do here is be open and thinking. And if one of these areas is an area that you might possibly struggle in, that you would write it down, even if it's just mentally, and take note of it. And I'll tell you why in a, in a few moments. I don't want to stay silent on these. I want to name them out loud so we can start to address them. First one is drugs. I was just reading this week about the rise of heroin addiction in North Jersey. You know, you always think drug addiction is a poor people problem. And we live in what, the wealthiest area of the nation? And it's on the rise. Obviously alcohol. I imagine we've all been touched by that one. Gambling. Just read about a Dumont woman who stole 500,000 from her boss and wasted it all on gambling. $500,000, I'm like, if I'm gonna steal, five, okay, well, I'm not gonna steal $500,000, but you would think, <laughs> not good for best, for, but you would think, you know, you, you would do something with it. Hopefully there's no elders in the congregation. Well, actually, no, hopefully there are elders here today, but all right, let's just move on, okay, let's jump. Wow, okay. Pornography, as Pastor Rob spoke about. And women, this includes those romance novels and and daydreaming and lusting after a romance that you see in Hollywood. Italians, don't yell blasphemy here, but how about food? <laughs> then I'll get stoned later. But how many of us run to snacks when we are stressed out in our lives? We have a whole snack shelf with Tinkies and Hostesses, now that they've returned, praise the Lord. <laughs> Cheez-Its. And every time we're stressed, we just, we go to them and we just munch and we munch and we chew and we munch. How about work? How many of us, when we're home, we spend more time thinking about work than we do our family? How many of us don't even stop working when we go on vacation? Shopping. The credit card debt that we have in this nation. We love to buy things. How about codependency? You don't always think of this one as an addiction. I was listening to a lady on the radio and she was talking about her dependency on attention. And she was saying that every time that she's not getting enough attention, what she does is she creates drama wherever she's at. She creates a problem so, and plays the victim so people will pay attention to her and they will care for her. And she said it's an ongoing cycle that's destroyed relationships in her life. How about our digital addiction? You know, Jonathan Edwards, wrote in 200 years ago, uh, he, was, he would talk about how upset he was at young people who would go off and have frivolous conversation. Or they would do something called bundling. 
This is where you get under the covers with somebody of the opposite sex with all your clothes on and just lay there and snuggle. That was the biggest problem, bundling. Now obviously that leads to temptation, but I'm like, geez, how times have changed. Now we have temptation right in our pockets with all the little things that make us happy, with an app for everything, between TVs and iPads and iPhones and computers and video games and that stupid little candy crush game. <laughs> There's a little digital crack. Don't ever play that game. If you've never picked it up, don't pick it up. Oh, little bombs and candies. Oh, I hate that game. <laughs> Surprised my wife hasn't screamed amen out loud yet. But there are so many addictions, I can't even remember them all. Sports, entertainment, there's probably a ton I haven't even listed that you could think of. I'd be here all day if I tried. But even though there's different types of addictions, they all have the same definition. They all have the same root. And simply put, an addiction is a compulsive dependence on a substance or an activity. Compulsive dependence. And it can also be on unhealthy, unhealthy things. I have seen the case where someone's addict, uh, someone uh, not here, back in Washington, they had an actual addiction to working out. They were part of CrossFit. And they spent so much time there that they were neglecting their family. I mean, if they flexed their mother so muscles, they could rip their shirt open, but they would go there and their family would be left on the side. So I don't think it's just unhealthy things. And you know what causes addiction? Sin. Sin. It's the, one of the results of when sin gets out of control in your life. 2 Peter 2.19 says, For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. That's why Paul writes in Romans 6, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. Now the term of authority here means not to have it lord over you. It should not be your lord. You should not worship it. And now some of you might think it's funny to worship an addiction. But think about what are some of the signs of worship. You focus on it. You think about it. You always go back to it. You give of your time to it, of your talents, of your money to it. And you do away, whether you realize it or not, with things that oppose it. Now church, what do we call things that we worship that are not God? Idols. idols. That's right, idols. And, and why do we turn to these idols in the first place? I think simply put, it's pleasure. Pleasure. Addiction at its most basic level is really the pursuit of pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure. And thus the avoidance of displeasure. And this is what makes it an idol. Because the only pleasure that we should go after is that that is found in God and His Word in his presence, in the presence of other believers, serving him, reaching out to others, caring for the poor. Now remember, as I said earlier, each of these things, each of these hostages, it starts with a lie. The lie being that these addictions, whatever it is, bring you happiness, can bring you fulfillment, take your problems away. Now let's go back to the work for a moment. You may, you know, you may think, wait, how is it being addicted to my job pleasure? I don't even like my job. That's why I'm overworked. That's why I check my email all the time. And maybe you're right. Maybe you, you don't find pleasure in your job. But you find pleasure in accomplishment. It feels so good to open up the phone, to check the email, to answer an email to delete an email. I mean, how many of you get euphoric over an empty email inbox? No, okay, there you go, get some honest people. Steve, why are you raising your hand? I know you never have an empty email inbox. I know, maybe that's why it's so exciting for when it actually happens. For some of you like Steve, I know an empty email inbox is like a, a magical figure, a, a unicorn. You've never really seen it. But it's so good because, okay, I've dealt with a problem, I've dealt with a problem, 
All right, I feel better. I've moved something forward. I've gotten something done. Because I don't feel like I did enough that day at work. But it's fleeting pleasure because we know work never ends. And this is why I said addictions are the pursuit of pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure, not the possession of it. And this is how we are held hostage. We keep chasing something that will never fill us, that will never complete us. We're like a dog chasing our tail. And what happens if we're one of those dogs that finally catches the tail? It hurts. And then what does the dog do? Starts chasing his tail again another day. And in the same way, that's how we treat addictions. I think that's why in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, a man who had everything, writes this whole book saying, everything is vanity without God. It all leads to nowhere. Now, just because you enjoy something does not mean you're addicted. 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be, key word here, controlled by anything. Now, he was speaking to the Jews in here, and he was saying, because the Jews believe there was some food that you shouldn't be eating. And he's saying, look, we can eat whatever we want. You're missing the point. The point is, to be conscious of what we do and how it affects us. Now outside of what I mentioned, outside of drugs, everything I've mentioned is legal. And you know, even drugs, some of them now, if you go to Washington or, or Colorado and more states to come. But this doesn't mean that it benefits our lives. Especially if it's something that keyword he saw controls us. Do you have something that's controlling you in your life today? Have you ever stopped to think, do I have something that is controlling me other than the Spirit of God? Now, how do I know the difference between something I just really enjoy and an addiction? Now, I have a few questions that I want to ask you to help you come up with this. And this is where you go back to taking that, maybe hopefully something you jotted down mentally on paper of of one of the areas I mentioned earlier, or maybe a different type of addiction that you thought, man, maybe I struggle with. This is where this comes into play. Okay. Do you engage in this activity, whatever it is on your mind, do you engage in this activity more now than you used to? Okay. In other words, you need more and more of this activity. For example, God designed our bodies miraculously to adapt to whatever environment we have and whatever um, goes into our body. And that's why you see an alcoholic, what got them drunk when they first started drinking soon becomes not enough, that they have to have more and more and more and more to get to that same place. The same with a drug addict. It's not enough. Do you engage in it more and more and more than you used to? Okay, do you, can, number two, do you continue to engage in this activity even though there's negative consequences? Do you continue to do it even though it's bad? For example, those of you who play video games, Stay up late playing video games so you don't get your homework done. You're tired the next day. You get bad grades or, or even for you adults, and I will, I'll point out the guys here, You continue to do it and play and stay up late and you're not spending time with your wife. Or for the ladies, you know, you're on Facebook so your husband feels distant from you and he says that to you but you keep doing it because of the consequences. Number three, have you ever lied to someone to hide the fact that you were engaged in this activity? Do you try to hide it? I think of, you know, pornography. Shut that laptop when someone walks into the room. Or maybe when you're done on the internet, you clear the cookies. For those of you who are tech challenged, I'm not talking about the kind you eat. You can Google it later. But do you erase all tracks of what you did? Number four, do you have withdrawal symptoms from when you not engage in this activity? Do you have a hard time not doing it? 
How many of you can set that work, can set your cell phone down and not check your email, check your Facebook, and not freak out? You have a hard time saying no to it. Number five, have you ever had family, friends, coworkers, anyone express to you a concern about your activity? And maybe it's something that you're doing in private that they don't see, but they have expressed a concern about who you are and how your personality has changed. I'm sure some of you know people who are addicted and you have seen this. These are some key factors to know when something becomes an addiction. And I mean, and this is how it holds you hostage. It's like, um, like what Stockholm Syndrome. You know, when, when someone's held captive by somebody else, they're with them for so long, they become to a place where they depend on them. They think they're there to care, protect them. They don't want to leave them. Even though whatever this addiction is, it's holding you hostage against your will. You become dependent on it. You have a sense of needing it. Need to get that fix in whatever it may be. And basically the addiction over you know, the large, you know, long time ends up breaking down your life and who you are. You end up being like you know, Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Sitting there, my precious. So your hair has fallen out and you're looking like a nasty little green person. It tears down your life, but all you can is focus on this. Now an addiction... It, it does not only hold you hostage, okay, but it holds those who you love and are around you hostage. I want to talk about the elephant in the room that can be sometimes for, for addicts, things that they don't want to admit. But addiction in any form is not a victim of slut crime. Someone just because they don't see an elephant doesn't mean they don't feel the effects. I mean, let's be honest. Let's think about an elephant. What do they do? They poop. I mean, they do. Nothing wrong with that. They smell. They're loud. They bump into things. Whatever environment they are in, they alter. And it's the same way struggling, someone struggling with addiction cannot help but to damage those around them, whether they see it or not. Uh, a husband, yeah, he may look at pornography in secret, but what is not in secret is when he no longer finds his wife attractive because he has this false images of beauty and romance in his mind. The father or mother who may drink alone may not affect anybody in that moment because of the guilt and shame that they have. They don't love their children as God has called them to or their children need them to. The person who turns to food every time stressed out and if eventually they, they put on such weight from it and they, they begin to believe this lie that they are not beautiful in the eyes of the Lord and they feel worthless and they stop giving of their time and pouring into others and they wallow in self-pity and they become useless instead of understanding who they are in God and the purpose that he's given them. And the list goes on. Addiction is not a victimless crime. And we all deal with it. Now, if this is the first time you've ever been here to Powerhouse, you may be thinking, man, this guy is a real bummer. I mean, really, I go through this entire week, and this is what I come for. But listen, I do not list out the depths of how addiction destroys to depress you, to make you feel guilty. I list them all out so that when I tell you that there is a God that is far more powerful than your addiction, you know the greatness of his love, his mercy, and his strength to pull you out of the depths of your addiction and to set you free. There are people in this room 
who can testify to the life-changing power of God. There are people in this room who have struggled with addiction or have seen people struggle with addiction and they have seen God set them free. And that same freedom and that same power is available to everybody. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what God has done about your addiction. Can I tell you, church? Let me tell you. Can I tell you? Come on. There we go. Here's what he's done about your sin. Psalms 103.12. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions, our sin from us. So, so far as the east is from the west. No, no. No, that's not enough. That's not enough. He comes over here. So far is from the east to the west, outside the building, across the oceans, he takes our sin and he separates it from us that we are no longer defined by our sin, but by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It's just our choice if we continue to look at it or not. Second Corinthians chapter five, he says, therefore if any man or woman be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away and things become new. That is the power of Jesus Christ. We saw this last week when we saw those eight people get baptized. That they go down and they are dead to their old self and they come up and they are alive in Christ. And they have a new hope, a new purpose in life that goes beyond anything they've ever imagined because they realize that they are a child of God and he has something greater for them. And notice what he requires of you to do this. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Romans 5.8, talked about it last week. God shows for his love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. It doesn't say that while we were still sinners, Christ died for everybody but you. It says he died for every single one of us. So we know that we have the freedom from addiction through the power of God, but how do we find that freedom? Okay, I thought I was hearing something. <laughs> Sorry, that messed me up. Lord, yes. I've never heard that ringer before. Sorry, okay. All right, focus. Okay. Satan trying to call and interrupt. Okay, how do we find that freedom? Okay, well it isn't by minimizing the problem. Minimizing our addictions, like we'll put them off, I'll, I'll work less later. I can quit this when I want. That's like taking black tape and putting it over a warning light. It doesn't make the problem go away. Not opening up the bill does not mean the debt disappears. Or in my case, not going to the dentist does not mean I don't need to. And it's not something that you can do by yourself. You say, ah, I can beat this. Yeah, I bet you have several years of experience and history that says otherwise. You have one choice, to turn to the one who came to proclaim to the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free, as we read in Luke chapter four. You need to turn to Jesus. It's time for an amen right there. You need to turn to Jesus, to our God. Now, C.S. Lewis, he writes that we all have a God-shaped hole right inside of us, that we were created by God for a relationship for him, a relationship with him. And sin separates us from that relationship. That's why we have addictions. We're trying to fill that hole with something else. Now to fill that hole, to bring back a right relationship, that means for some of you today, committing your life to Jesus Christ, saying, dear God, I believe in you. I repent for trying to do it my own way. I want to follow you the rest of my days. Lord, I pray you would save me. And boom, just like that. The power of God. What's he say? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. It doesn't put any ifs on it. 
Many things that we have to do. Confess our sins, and he is faithful and just. Now, this is not just a one-time thing, but it's a daily dependence upon God. As you said in Romans 7, Paul says, Ah, I know nothing as good as in me, in my flesh. I know I have the desire to do what is right, but I just can't do it. Even as when we're lost in one of these types of addictions where we want to, like, want to get out, even when we see the damage, but we just can't get out on our own. We keep going back to it. This is talking about leaning on God every day in prayer for his strength and his guidance. Number two, you've got to share your final ten. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. That you may be healed. God does not call us to walk alone. We are here to support each other. This is how we are called to walk in life. That's part of being a Christian, walking together. The problem is, when we confess to one another what's going on in our lives, we don't normally do all of it, do we? As one pastor put, we like to talk about 90%. Let me share 90% with you, just the 90, not the other 10. It's easy to share 90, isn't it? Ah, oh, I need to work on my marriage, be a better parent to my kids. I've got to manage my finances better, stop spending too much, or whatever it is for you. But if you want freedom from addictions in your life, you've got to share that final 10%. But we don't want to, do we? I know I don't. We want to hide it. This is my 10%. You're not going to see it. And why? Because we're ashamed, aren't we? We're embarrassed. Even if we know that same person is struggling with the same thing, it makes it a little easier, but we're still embarrassed. We're still ashamed. I mean, we all got stuff. We all got sin. And here's the awesome thing. When you finally get the encourage to share, what happens? It encourages other people to start sharing their final 10. Isn't that cool? We don't even have to overcome our addiction to start working in other lives. Just by naming it to somebody else, it makes it easy for others. Have you ever noticed that any type of life group that meets once one person shares, then the others start to share, and this community is created? Before you even found healing, you're helping others heal. That's how awesome our God is. And the devil doesn't want this. He doesn't want it, he wants you to keep it silent because it's easy to hold on to. But you gotta take that final 10%, drag it out of the dark and bring it into light. You gotta take that addiction, kicking and screaming and say, I won't hide you anymore, here's my addiction. Help me find freedom in Jesus. Kicking and screaming the entire way. Say, no more, I'm done. I'm done. We see this every week. We have a group of men who meet up here Thursday night, celebrate recovery, and they hold each other accountable. They keep each other from falling back into the darkness. So when they, one of them starts to, to wander this way, they all just grab them and pull them back. We have life groups for men, women, couples, mixed, whatever the life situation. We have, we have groups here that meet people to walk alongside of you. The only thing that holds you back is from you stepping in and getting involved in one of them. Start praying that in your life, God will bring people that you can share that final 10 with. Okay? Ask us pastors. We will help you get there. Some of you may need professional help. I don't know. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as that help that is being provided to you is keeping your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. You cannot make it alone. Finally, fight for your freedom. Fight for freedom. In the story of Cain and Abel, right before Cain kills Abel, he talks to God, and what does God say to him? He warns him about his sin getting out of control. God says to him, sin is crouching. It's hiding at your door. Its desire is for you, but you gotta rule over it. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to notice that sin. That's why he talks about crouching, hiding. The 
The enemy doesn't want you to notice the sin. He wants to distract you, isolate you, give you a little porn, maybe a little food you can't say no to, extra emails you can't not answer, a credit card you cannot say no to, a relationship you cannot say no to. They want to keep you in that situation, keep you close to that addiction. But you know what that means? That you go on the defense. You go on the defense. Hear me out. You avoid temptation. What do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? That he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. And he will always, listen, always provide a way out. This means if you struggle with a job, you don't go out for a drink. That means you sacrifice things. That means if you get offered a job somewhere that's worth tons of money and a great opportunity, but I know that it'll put you in the middle of alcohol all the time, then you say, no. Better you be poor and free than rich and a slave to sin. If you've got a job that demands too much of your life and your family is suffering, sell the big house, sell the extra car, and find a job that does not risk your the house, the car, all of it burns. It's all gone. But the legacy and what you pour into your children will go on for generations. You can't stop spending? Cut up the cards. And don't just, you gotta look ways to minimize your exposure. Say, how do I keep this away from me? And then find someone to help hold you accountable. And don't just go on the defense, but go on offense. Start memorizing scripture. The word of God has no equal in its power. It saves your marriage. It can save your family. It saves your soul. It, in the tough times, it reminds you that you can do all things. You get the sticky notes. Get the, you know, the prayer apps. Post them everywhere. Make it your background, your screensaver. Have your wife text it to you. Your friend text it to you. Get the word of God into your life. It's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to know it and speak it into your situation. And anybody who does that will know what I mean. And start praying. Pray throughout the day. Ask God, help me today. Help me. You, in the middle of the day, you're struggling with that addiction. That's where the accountability comes in because you call up and say, brother, sister, I'm struggling. Help me out. You don't have that right. I call the church in the middle of the day and say, I just need prayer right now. We can pray with you. We don't just do it on Sundays. Ask God to help you stay out of temptation. But let me be clear on this. You can't say, Lord, help me not get hit by a semi-truck while you're standing in the middle of Route 17. Okay? That don't work. You gotta back up that prayer with action. And finally, Start using those time, those talents, those focus, everything that you've given to that addiction, start using it for the glory of God. There is nothing more healing, nothing more healing in your life than when you start pouring it out for others. Because you start to realize, I'm not a victim. I can make a difference in the lives of others. God given me strength and abilities and powers, and I can touch people for his glory. Nothing more healing. Fight for your freedom. Breaking free, it, it doesn't happen overnight. But God's word promises that he will strengthen us. That we, when we resist temptation, he's going to walk with us every step of the way and help us. And all things are possible through him who gives us strength. And maybe it doesn't mean you're free from sin. Maybe you stumble from time to time. But you know what you do? You keep getting back up. When you struggle, you keep getting back up. When you sin, you keep getting back up. You keep getting back up. Say, I'm not going to believe the lies of the devil. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside you. No sin, no power, no addiction is stronger than the power of God. That's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you realize that? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is inside you, bringing you closer to God. And I tell you, as you start making those little choices and you break your own cycles with the power of God, and when you do, you will see life change that's beyond your expectations. It will be beautiful, gratifying, in mind-blowing ways. 
And then it comes full circle when down the road you found healing and one day, plop, right in front of you is somebody struggling with the same addiction you had and God says, help that person. <sighs> you mean God can take all the pain, all the hurt I caused to me and everybody else and he can use it for his glory? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's how good our God is. That's how good our God is. But it all starts with us turning to him. Let's bow our heads. Now, there's one last thing I want to say to you. You bow your heads, just close your eyes, listen to my words. When you look in the mirror... Who do you see? Do you see an addict? Because that's not what God sees. God sees my, his son or his daughter who's struggling with an addiction. God sees someone with the ability to overcome that addiction through his power and to change the world for his name. We just have to believe it. And I also want to say to those of us that are children of those who struggle with addiction, your future is not determined by the struggles of your parents. I struggled when I was younger because I have two parents that are both alcoholics. And I thought, man, I guess that's just my future. But then I learned in the word of God. He does not see me as a future alcoholic. He does not see my mother as an alcoholic or a father an alcoholic. He sees us all as his children made in his image. Waiting for us to overcome, to turn to him so we can start living the life that he has called for us. That doesn't mean I don't avoid alcohol and I'm not wary because I see it in my parents, so I make sure I'm careful. But understand that who I am is in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. And I pray this morning, if you are struggling with your identity because of addiction, whether it is through your parents or on your own, that you will make this day that you will turn to God. And it's so simple to do. In your own mind, you will just say, dear God, in your own words, don't have to be mine. I believe in you. I believe that you have created me, that you rose from the dead. I ask your forgiveness for not following you. I want to follow you the rest of my days. Help me to do that, Jesus. And just like that, God has entered your life in a new way. because I want to ask if you are somebody struggling with addiction I want you to stand up if you are somebody who knows somebody who's struggling with addiction I want you to stand up if you're struggling with addiction you can stand if you know somebody who's struggling with addiction you can stand I'm standing too person standing here this morning, those who are representing themselves and those who are representing somebody they know. Father, we pray, we plead for the power of your spirit to make change in their lives, that they will confess their sin, that they will confess their addictions, and they will say no more. I, Lord, I pray that you would bring new people into their lives out of nowhere to speak truth to them. It will happen in such a way, just people they never know, they'll come up and say, hey, God told me to pray for you, or God wants me to say this to you, or they'll hear something on the radio, or they'll see something on a website. I don't know how it looks, Lord, but that it'll get their attention. And I, Lord, I pray that they will come here one day, and they will not just be standing here because I asked them to stand, but they will be coming to stand to say, Jesus set me free, and I want everybody to know. 
We pray that in faith. We pray that in the Jesus name. Jesus' name.